Merrill Max Highlights. And here's your host, Robin Merrill. Hello and welcome to Euromax Highlights. Here are some of the stories coming up. Danish design. Copenhagen is a major European style capital. Fake food. Stephanie Kilgast from France and her miniature creations. And radical renovation. A former school in Amsterdam becomes a home and studio. New Year's Eve is the time when fireworks light up the skies here in Europe and in many other places too. As a trained pyrotechnician, the artist Jan Leonardo Vellet is allowed to use fireworks the whole year round. And he's a pioneer of pyro photography, setting up displays in the dark and then photographing the fireworks as they go off. The results are quite extraordinary. Jan Leonardo Verlut's creations go up in flames, but they don't burn out in a flash. The photographer uses time exposures to fix them on film. What fascinates me is to tame the fireworks, to feel the power and to control it and make art from it. I work exclusively with time exposures, partly because I use time as my stage to make art with light. The final product is a photograph. Verlert's photos are fine pyrotechnic art. The surroundings are just as important as what he does with flames and sparks. Willard travels throughout Europe looking for places where he can legally set off his fireworks. He carries everything he needs in his car. Lamps, blankets, and the camera itself. This time he's shooting in a rundown former hospital outside Berlin. It's important for the light art and the location to become one and tell a story. At this location, I have to pay special attention to the reflecting surfaces, bright surfaces that reflect the light. That's expressive and tells a story. These walls have seen a lot, maybe even the passing of life, and I might be able to breathe new life into them with my light. The surroundings interact with Willert's light art. He uses pyrotechnics or LED lamps as his medium. Willert often works when others are sleeping. His projects also require physical fitness, like being able to rotate a pole for long periods of time. Here you can see very clearly that the pole is always in the center. The breathing is very important. I do autogenous training for it, a special training for the leg muscles and the abdominal muscles. Authenticity is also important to Willert. He refuses to digitally refinish his photographs. There are certain light effects that you just can't simulate afterwards. And besides, we want the image to be impressive on its own merits. One of Willard's clients was Diesel, for whom he shot a film in an old distillery. For Nike, Willard infused World Cup soccer jerseys with light. Another client was the Swedish band Covenant, whom Willert choreographed and photographed. As he did with the American band, The Strokes. This photo from 2008 won a prize for scientific photography. At the ruined hospital, Jan Leonardo Willert demonstrates a technique he developed himself. What I brought in that was new at the time was the performance and the choreography. That lets you plan moves so they can be repeated. 
He starts out with a pole with concert lights attached to it. Out of that, he creates this photo. A photo is done. A photo is something special if I can stand back and say, wow, I didn't see that before. That's new, that's exceptional. Jan Leonardo Verlert is out and about almost every night in search of ever more spectacular locations. He says the resulting images are like paintings, using various forms of light to capture carefully choreographed movements. Amazing photos, and it looks like they're great fun to make. On the 1st of January 2012, Denmark takes over the presidency of the European Union. This rotates between member countries of the EU every six months. So, good enough reason for us to have a look around the Danish capital, Copenhagen. An absolute must for people interested in design and fashion. The Little Mermaid. For more than a hundred years, she's been watching the tourists come and go. Just like the Royal Guards, another symbol of Copenhagen. But these days, the Danish capital is also famous for something else, its role as a hub of hipness. Downtown Copenhagen is brimming with designer stores, and the streets are teeming with fashion. I think in general, like we we have grown up um, with a history in design, uh, a certain kind of style, uh, maybe the weather, the country, the culture. We kind of grown up with um, a certain kind of uh, a vision, without we maybe knowing. It. Henrik Vipskov is the hot new name on the Danish design scene. After studying in London, he returned to Copenhagen to set up his own label. Today, his creations feature in exhibitions at high-profile venues like New York's Museum of Modern Art. Louis Becker is also part of the Danish design boom. A partner of Henning Larsen Architects, he's the name behind the city's new opera house. It is a good place to be as, a, as an architect or a designer. There is a cross-pollination between design, architecture and art, and even performing arts, uh, which is quite fruitful for, for what we're doing. I think for Scandinavia, this is the cultural and artistic hub uh, of the region. Copenhagen also features outstanding architecture from the 17th century. Christiansborg Palace, which is the seat of parliament, is only one century old, but fits nicely into the old school cityscape. In recent years, a series of modern buildings have been added to the skyline. The opera house is less than six years old. While the Royal Danish Playhouse only opened in 2008. Not much older, the new Royal Library Extension. All three buildings are located in the city's Old Harbor District. The Sluzaholmen area has also undergone massive redevelopment, and its canals and waterfront make it especially popular with families. Each house has its own jetty. In the city planning, it, it's, it, it's been successful to bring in the water again, have kind of added to the qualities. Uh, before, the whole city was kind of leaning its back or taking its back to, to the harbor here. Now you see this very nice mix of open uh, uh, water and, and dense city. The Opera House is across the water from the historic old town. It took a relatively rapid four years from the initial sketches to the official opening. The open design and propensity of glass have a purpose. The way it kind of is transparent to the city is part of, of, of a vision of saying that a cultural event happening inside needs to spill out in the public domain. You have to be, let's say, part of the party or part of the festive, even though you haven't bought a ticket to this place. The Danish Museum of Art and Design is a testimony to that mentality. 
In recent decades, Denmark has developed a reputation for great design, but the pioneers were in fact architects. We say that the furniture is democratic because many of the architects, they wanted to create uh, furniture for everyone that everyone could afford. The only problem with it and the reason that Denmark didn't create IKEA like Sweden did is that all the architects were educated as cabinet makers too, so they wouldn't compromise with the quality. Architects like Arne Jakobsen, Paul Henningsen and Werner Panton put Danish design on the map back in the 1950s. But that appreciation and love of fine form seems to apply to the general public, especially in the capital. Design is very important for, for people in, in Copenhagen. They're very interested in it and they're spending a lot of time uh, studying uh, design, what's happening in, in design. And they're spending a lot of money on, on uh, objects for their home and, and for their living. In a city where design and style are appreciated, the distinctly unmodern but timeless form of the Little Mermaid is perhaps an ideal symbol. To France now to visit Stéphanie Kilgast. She actually studied architecture and architects make miniature versions of their designs. Well, Stéphanie Kilgast loved doing that, but what she loves more is making miniature food. Not of the edible variety, but she does it so well her miniature models of food look good enough to eat. These treats might look appetizing, but in fact they're made of plastic and are downsized to a scale of 1 to 12. Stephanie Kilgast makes her delicious looking miniatures from a polymer clay known as Fimo. She's turned a hobby into her profession. I love eating. And that gives me more material to design than, say, furniture. The good thing is that creating food is mainly about making models. And that's something I really love doing. The architecture graduate launched her Small is Beautiful enterprise in 2007. The focus on food is no coincidence. Food is great to work with artistically. It's simple to work with. And the colors are especially important. My favorite artist, like Kandinsky, made intensive use of color. As with real food, the crucial part is getting the ingredients right. Using only her hands, she produces a roll that, when cut, yields perfect orange slices. Pastel chalk helps give her creations a more authentic look. Her passion for making miniatures goes back to her childhood, when she would give her dolls make-believe food. People tend to like little things. Seeing the world in miniature helps give you an overview. It's a very human thing. It's as if we could just pack the world up and put it in our pocket. Her main source of inspiration is cookbooks from Germany, Finland and Britain. Stephanie lives and works in Van on the coast of Brittany. She does of course also get new ideas from a visit to the local bakery or market. I'd like to give my work more meaning through the content and give it more of a dramatic context. One thing I'd like to do is create miniature city scenes and then also add a humorous touch. But for the time being, she's happy that her products are selling briskly, including croissants, which no self-respecting French innovator would overlook in their collection. She sells up to 120 of her handmade creations a month online. Cakes, waffles, and pastries are particularly popular. Her most expensive creation to date cost 450 euros. She also makes special collections for Christmas and Easter. 
The scaled down feasts take between five minutes and several weeks to make, depending on the amount of detail. Sometimes she includes the entire backdrop. Some are even turned into jewelry, earrings, necklaces, rings, and bracelets. There aren't many people making models of food like I do. In France, there are people who make bijoux gourmands. But I want mine to be so fine that you can barely notice that it's actually a croissant and not an earring. Her jewelry items cost between 10 and 40 euros. Stephanie Kilgast sells her handmade wares through her website and selected stores. She has customers in Europe, the US, Japan and Australia. The old town of Vannes, one of Stephanie Kilgast's favorite spots for relaxing. Unlike conventional culinary creators, she can't eat what she conjures up. So it's nice to sink her teeth into some real food. A look at a huge house in Amsterdam now. From the front it appears to be a normal townhouse on a canal, but in fact it was a school complex of over 1,000 square metres before it was converted by the artist Michel Deiters and her family. Living alongside the canals that bisect downtown Amsterdam has its unique appeal, but housing in the city's historic centre is in big demand and comes at a high price. The Magere Bruch is one of the most charming bridges across the Amstel. Close by is this villa. Sculptor Michel Deiters has been living and working here for the past six years. It's her oasis, a refuge from the hustle and bustle outdoors. The abundance of light gives the rooms extra depth. There's a huge combined living and dining room that's both spacious and functional. Michelle Deiters favors classic furnishings, while the kitchen is more of a high-tech affair. The floorboards originally graced a French monastery. Souvenirs from her trips to Asia and Africa, reflecting the owner's taste. It's a mixture of style and of uh, periods and of different sorts of art and so I would call it eclectic. This is the way I like it. I like to have things around me. I'm absolutely the opposite of a minimalistic person. Down on the ground floor is where the artist does her work. Yeah. Yeah. This is her office area. Michelle does the preliminary work for her sculptures in the traditional manner, with a hammer and chisel. But the end product is a mysterious play of light under glass. Well, art is very conceptual. Uh, the things I make now, I make together with my daughter. She is a, a sculptress as well, but she is also a jeweler. And she is, of course, of a different era. She's much more contemporary as, as a person, of course. Um, and so our art is uh, very contemporary and conceptual, far more modern than the house is. So I'll show you around in the studio. Um, so this is the place where my daughter and I work. And this is where we uh, exhibit our work and work of others and um, you know it's a place where events are held and a lot of things are happening here. The studio was originally a gymnasium. Michelle's son pops by for a visit. He's an interior designer and helped transform what was basically a totally run-down structure. It was taken over by squatters and they completely ruined the whole building and there was graffiti everywhere, everything was broken, all the walls were taken out. So it was re really a derelict, uh, a derelict um, property. One story above the living room is the library. The dark wood provides a marked contrast to the otherwise light surroundings. And the reading room is home to a rather original secret. We've decided to make these covered doors, which are actually built into the bookcases 
because we also really like the elements of the secret doors. Um, and as you can see, it's integrated into the bookcase, which gives a great, great effect uh, to the space. The house has four floors connected by both a staircase and an elevator. The top floor features the bedroom and the bathroom. The idea of a combined living and working space originally appealed to the owner. Six years after moving in, though, she now has a different perspective. People come and go, and it's always busy, and there's always a lot going on. And um, uh, you, in a way, I have the feeling sometimes that it it is too much too much integration, and I find that disturbing. You know, I like to have my uh, privacy and to be able to sort of withdraw. That's why Michelle Deiters now wants to give up the studio part of the building and find a new place for her work. Finally today, we're going to be very pan-European and visit a cross-border area called the Bohemian Forest where Germany, Austria and the Czech Republic all meet. There's a mountain there with the intriguing name of Drei Sesselberg, which literally means three-chair mountain. However, this is a place not for couch potatoes. This is for sports fans and especially those with stamina. When Hans Fuchs from Heidmüller in the Bavarian forest straps on his cross-country skis, he has more than 600 kilometers of challenging terrain to explore. Today, he's covering the area around Dreisesselberg. The mountain is located just a few hundred meters from the Czech and Austrian border. The unique thing about this area is that you can cross-country ski cross-border in Germany, the Czech Republic and Austria, in this peaceful landscape on beautiful trails that cover every level of difficulty, there's something for everyone. Hans Fuchs is heading in the direction of Austria. After 10 kilometers of steep climbs and speedy descents, he reaches the Austrian village of Schwarzenberg. He stops for a break in Stifterhof, which serves home-cooked cuisine with a gourmet flair. Cross-country skiers from all over the world replenish their energy reserves here. Nearby in Schöneben, there are regular races which attract the creme de la creme of cross-country skiing. Werner Ede is a ski instructor at Schöneben's long-distance center. We are accompanying him on the next stage of our three-nation tour. His favorite trail leads to the Moldaublick lookout tower. It offers a spectacular view over the border triangle. It's important to maintain this area as an unspoiled tourist area. That's what we want. The next day, the trek continues toward the Czech Republic. The Bohemian Forest used to be a military no-go zone until the Iron Curtain fell 22 years ago. Here, Werner Erde crosses the border. No mass tourism, the forest, the meadows. You're surrounded by nature, and the conservation authorities on the Czech side are working hard to keep everything as is. Occasionally, the calm is broken by the snow grooming machines. My section covers the trails as far as Austria to ensure that it's possible to move between the countries without a problem. The journey passes Lake Lipno and continues to the town of Horny Plana. The writer Adalbert Stifter was born here in 1805. Nature played an integral role in his novels. We meet Hans Fuchs again here. After passing the northern slope of the Dry Sesselberg, he crosses another border, this time from the Czech Republic into Germany. You don't really notice because you don't see any difference. It's all become a single unit. 
Its region that is no longer divided by borders. It's simply the Bohemian Forest, an invigorating, beautiful cross-country skiing area. Hans Fuchs finishes his trek in the Riedelsbach Tavern, which serves up the best beers from the three countries. After quenching his thirst, Fuchs has to travel mere meters now to reach his home. A new beer would come into it somewhere. That's all we've got time for today. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to see any of those reports again, go to dw-world.de slash English slash Euromax highlights. For now, though, bye-bye. <laughs>